In this video, we are going to talk about Ethernet speed standards and physical media. We are going to talk about switch port configuration and we are going to talk about detecting some error conditions that we can encounter on ports on our switch. When we talk about Ethernet standards, we are really talking about Ethernet speeds. How much data in an amount of time we can send out of this interface? What's the bandwidth? on these interfaces. Generally speaking, in this day and age, uh, there are four standards that are very, very widely used. Well, I should really say three, but we, we can go with four. It, it makes sense. The slowest one that we can still encounter today is 10 megabits per second. 10 megabits per second is uh, standard IEEE 802.13 and it is the original Ethernet standard. So this is the original Ethernet speed. This is not very widely used today. This is why I said it. it we, we can say it's four, but it makes sense saying it's only three because it's very, very seldom actually seen in modern day networks. This is also referred to as 10 base T standard. It's not the only standard that is in use or uh, that existed. We had 10 base 2 and 10 base 5, but these were not based on hubs or switches. These were based on coax cables, uh, thick and thin Ethernet, as they used to be called. Int important characteristic about 10 megabit per second Ethernet, about 10 base T, is that it doesn't support full duplex by standard. Some vendor implementations, like for example Cisco, do support full duplex on Ethernet, but this is not, uh, this is not to be expected. This is not something that has been standardized. The next one, and this one is widely used, is 100 megabits per second or IEEE 802.3U. Now, this comes in several varieties, but the most common, commonly used ones are 100 base TX and 100 base FX. There are others, 100 base T4, if I'm not much mistaken, but it is very, very unlikely that you are ever going to encounter these in, in any equipment. I don't, I don't even know if Cisco supports anything other than those two that I mentioned. The difference between the TX and the FX version is that the TX is what we commonly refer to as the Ethernet cable or the thing on the picture behind me. This is just a category 5 or category 6 uh, cable that has eight wires and it uses the RJ type connector. FX on the other hand is based on fiber optics. These fiber optics can have different connectors. They are usually either a uh, LC, which are the uh, smaller um, SFP, ki SFP kind of uh, connector or slightly larger ones uh, called the SC connectors. So TX is copper and FX is fiber. In 100 megabit per second Ethernet, we do actually have uh, the capability to negotiate half duplex or full duplex transmission. Now, I mentioned half duplex and full duplex twice so far. Let me explain it a little bit. So, what happens if on a network segment we have only two devices that are connected? and they are directly connected. So there is nothing in between, just host A directly connected to host B. Now, one of these could be just a host and the other one could be, for example, a switch or it could be a router or any device. It doesn't matter what these devices actually are, but they are directly connected. So there is nothing else between them. Now, if we have only two hosts connected and we are using twisted pair connections, which means that we are using four wires to uh, uh, interconnect, which means we are using two pairs of wires. So we have really just this kind of thing set up. Now, we can say that this pair of wires here is connected to the transmit side of the uh, circuit. This one is connected to the receiving side and we have the exact reversal of roles on this pair here. So let's call this one a green pair and let's call this one a blue pair 
of wires. So traffic sent by A to B is going to go over the blue pair and traffic sent from B to A is going to be sent over the green pair of wires. Really, is there a need to detect any collisions here? Can there be a third device on this network segment that can transmit? Well, the answer is simply no. So, running this in half duplex mode, in other words, speaking only one at a time, makes absolutely no sense. And this was recognized relatively early in the standardization phase of Ethernet when um, engineers, when the designers of Ethernet were designing fast Ethernet. And they recognized that this particular sol solution here is a solution that can be used to our advantage to implement a full duplex communication. Full duplex communication means that both A and B can speak at the same time without fear of any collisions. And this is something that fast Ethernet tries to negotiate. It's very, very important because instead of having 100 megabits per second overall, we actually have 100 megabits in each direction between A and B, which means that effectively we have 200 megabits per second capacity between A and B. Very, very important thing. Now, let's go back to, um, to other standards that we have. And here we have the next one is 1 gigabit per second Ethernet or IEEE standard 802.3z or Z. This comes in <laughs> really wide variety of standards. Now, I'm going to have to uh, remove myself from here so that you can see all the standards that we have here. So gigabit per second comes in 1000 base T, 1000 base CX, 1000 based uh, SX, 1000 based LX or LH, and 1000 based ZX. Now 1000 base T, as you might guess, is actually a copper based. It uses category six uh, cabling. Uh, 1000 base CX, uh, to be honest, I can't really remember which one that is. It's not very, very widely used. We have 1000 based SX, which is something that we call the uh, multi-mode fiber that uses 62.5 uh, nanometer micron, uh, no, um, nanometers um, uh, fiber connection. Then we have 1000 based LX or LH, which uses the single mode fiber, which is, I believe, nine microns diameter and it's used for very very long distances. I believe that the distance there is 10 kilometers which is about seven miles or so. I I'm, I'm, do apologize, I'm metric. And then we have 1000 based ZX which is for extreme high distances. This is when we go to 40 kilometers and in some cases we can go even further with a ZX if we have really really strong lasers in our transmitters. Personally I was involved in a project where we have been uh, shooting this uh, to a distance of about 100 miles, so about 150, 160 kilometers with specialized lasers. 10 gigabits per second, 802.3AU, comes in even wider variety of standards. We have 10 G base SR, SW, we have 10 G base uh, LR or LW, we have 10 G base ER, EW, 10 G base LX4, LW, and so on and so on and so on and so on. The real point about the 10 gigabit per second Ethernet is that it is full duplex. There is no half duplex there. Also, both gigabit Ethernet and the 10 gigabit Ethernet utilize eight wires, four pairs in a cable. So the cable that you see above me here would be okay for uh, gigabit Ethernet and for the copper standard uh, for 10 gigabits per second, but only if all wires have actually been connected. And this is very important, especially if you are installing um, 10 gigabit Ethernet or gigabit Ethernet in slightly older wiring closet where the um, installers, the original field engineers, field technicians took some shortcuts to just make fast Ethernet work, which needs only four wires. But for gigabit Ethernet, you need to use all eight wires. So be careful about that. Also, very common thing is that 
If you wanted to connect two hosts directly, let's say two PCs or switch to switch or router to router, for fast Ethernet and, and uh, 10 meg uh, per second Ethernet, we used crossover cables where we would actually cross uh, the transmit to the uh, receive side on the other, uh, other side of the connection instead of relying on these connections being inverted on the ports. I'm going to talk about that in, in, in a second. So crossover cables were just fine for fast Ethernet, but they no longer work for gigabit Ethernet or 10 gig Ethernet if you are using copper connections there. For fiber, none of this applies. So going to the next topic here, and we're going to talk about the Ethernet port configuration. When we are configuring uh, ports on the switches, we can configure multiple things. Now, the first thing that I'm going to talk about is actually the last thing here on the slide. I'm going to talk about how do we specify which port we want to configure. Let me show you what I mean here. Let's say that we have a relatively simple desktop switch uh, from Cisco. What I mean by relatively simple is the switch that is in a fixed format that doesn't have uh, multiple line cards. A good example of this kind of switch is, for example, 3560 from Cisco. So this switch here is just a fixed format, which means that it has any number of ports. It depends on the model, but usually they have 24 or 48 ports. But let's say that we have 24 ports. If we want to configure port number one here, this port would actually be either fast Ethernet or gigabit Ethernet zero slash one. Now, this zero here refers to the module, the interface module that exists on the device. In case of fixed configuration devices, this applies to switches and routers, the first module, that the one that is actually built into the device, is always going to be zero. It used to be in very long days that we didn't have that on Cisco devices, that this device would just be Fast Ethernet 1 or Fast Ethernet 2 or Fast Ethernet 3. But these days, almost all devices coming out from Cisco have this kind of numbering scheme. So the first number here refers to the module, and this one here refers to the port on the module itself. But sometimes things are not as straightforward as this. Sometimes we have switches that are a little bit more complicated. Let's take, for example, a 6500 switch into account. Now, 6500 switch can have any number of line cards installed. Line cards are really just cards that carry a lot of slots, uh, oh, sorry, a lot of ports. Now, these line cards here have their own module identifier. So let's say that this is module 0, this one here is module 1, this one is module 2, and so on. The numbering may or may not start from zero. Now, some line cards actually have ability to install additional sub-modules there. They're just kind of carrier cards for other cards. In this case, if you wanted to configure port number one on module number zero on uh, sub-module 1, the actual port number there would be, let's say, fast Ethernet. We are going to have slot, this is actually slot 0 slash 1 slash 0, if this was here port number 0. So the naming convention here for interfaces becomes a little bit more involved. It depends on the switch type, it de depends on the device type, what slot 0 is, what module 0 is, what module 1 is. So this is something that you simply have to learn for the device that you are actually working on. In almost all examples that I'm doing here, my switch that I'm using is actually Catalyst 3560. So it's a fixed configuration switch here. So all my interfaces actually have the naming convention type module and it's always going to be zero because this is a fixed configuration switch and then finally I have the interface number here one two three and so on. If I take a look at fast internet zero one and gigabit zero one 
I can see that the actual number here that we have, 1 and 0, 1, kind of overlaps. This is perfectly okay. This is not referring to the actual same interface. These are the two completely different interfaces because the type of the interface here is also significant. So this is the first interface on module 0 of type fast Ethernet. This is the first interface on module 0 of type gigabit Ethernet. Cisco does it this way, some other vendors do it slightly differently. And with some other vendors, you cannot have this overlapping thing. But this is perfectly okay. On Cisco, you can actually have these overlaps. So when we are configuring ports, and when we have selected which port we want to configure with our interface type slot slash module slash port, or just type uh, interface type uh, slot slash port, then we can configure certain characteristics of the interface. By default, on all modern Cisco switches, the port is automatically configured by default to be in a no shutdown state. It's configured to be in auto negotiation mode. It, that means it will negotiate speed in duplex with the other side. This is very, very important concept here. If you want to have a reliable connectivity between two hosts in your network. You need to make sure that the speed matches, that the duplex settings also match. You can do this in two ways. One is manually set the configuration on both sides or set it to be negotiating on both sides. If you don't negotiate from both sides, you can have a rather unpredictable result. And this is something that I'm going to talk about in just a minute. So let me show you what I mean here. If I go back to my switch here and I take a look at the configuration of Fast Ethernet 01, I can see that I have some additional configuration there. This is just to make the port come up faster uh, to, to, for spanning tree to move into forwarding state a little bit faster. So it doesn't have any significance to what I'm talking about now. I can see that this is a default configuration on the port other than that. So let's take a look at, for example, Fastinet 05. This is the default configuration, except that I have actually shut it down. So really no differences there. If I take a look at what's the situation on Fastinet 01, I can see here that this port is operating in a full duplex mode at 100 megabits per second speed, and I can see that the media type is 100 base TX. So this is a 100 megabit port operating at 10 megabits per second. Now, device that is connected on the other side here is my router R1. This is the configuration on the other side. So I can see here that my duplex is set to auto, that my speed is set to automatic. Let me go about and change one of these parameters. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say speed 10 megabits per second. What's going to happen now is when I do shutdown and I do no shut and when interface comes back up, if I go back to my cat1, what I'm going to see here is that the port is operating in 10 megabits per second. We also appear to have negotiated full duplex here. And if I do show interface fast in a 00 on the other side, it looks like negotiated full duplex. I'm operating at 10 megabits per second, which is okay. 10 megabits per second is fast enough for certain things. But the important thing is that if the speed doesn't match, your interface won't come up. The other side is negotiating, so the interface actually came up. When configuring ports manually, there are really four things that we can configure. Well, three plus one that I'm going to just mention. It's not really that important. It happens only in rare 
circumstances. We can configure the speed of the port and depending on the uh, interface that you have, this is usually going to be either 10 megabits per second, 100 megabits per second, or 1000 megabits per second, really one megabit per second, one gigabit per second. We can set the duplex settings. This can be either automatic duplex or it can be half duplex or it can be full duplex. Another thing that we can set on most modern switches is do we want to uh, have the port operate in MDI or MDIX configuration? MDI stands for Media Dependent Interface. What we mean by this is if we go back to uh, our first drawing here on the, on the whiteboard, you can see here that one side, uh, our green pair on switch B, is operating in transmit mode and the blue ones are operating in receive mode. What if we connected another switch to this switch B? Let's examine that again on the whiteboard. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to add a new page and I'm going to have let's say switch 1 connected to switch 2. Now, if we assume that the left-hand side of the switch is transmit and the right-hand side is receive, this is what we are going to end up with. We are going to have a transmit connecting to transmit and a receive connecting to receive. In other words, we are not going to get a lot of communication there. This used to be solved by using a crossover cable. A cable that is actually going to make a cross here so that we invert receive and transmit in the cable itself. That is because switches have ports that operate in MDI X mode. Hosts, on the other hand, like routers or your PCs or whatever devices we have, operate in MDI mode. MDI is designed to connect to MDI X. Now, using crossover cables doesn't always work because for gigabit speeds, not a good thing. So this is why in most modern switches, the ports can actually dynamically determine whether they want to operate in the transmit mode or they want to operate in the receive mode. So this is something that you can actually configure on the interface and the command that is MDIX Auto. Now, if you connect, if you configure MDIX Auto, the switch is automatically going to determine whether to, uh, it's automatically going to determine should the ports be in the receive or transmit mode, the uh, uh, different uh, pins on the port. You can actually turn uh, this configuration off. So here, Now I have disabled this functionality. So now if I wanted to connect switch to switch, I would actually have to use a crossover cable. For fast internet and, uh, and regular ethernet, 10 megabits per second, this is no big deal. But if I wanted to use gigabit ethernet, I would need to create a special crossover cable. It doesn't look the same and the wiring is not the same as with those other crossover cables. The last thing that I wanted to mention in this segment is the concept of configuring the media type. Now, there are some devices that have one port that can be connected to either a fiber connection or to a copper connection using RJ45 connector. An example device here is, say, a 3900 router or 3800 router, which has one port that has both the copper connection and the SFP. And on the interface, you can choose which one of these connections you want to use. You can't use them at the same time, so you have to make a decision. Which one do you actually care about? On my uh, po equipment pod here, I actually have a device like that. This is my R2. It has gigabit ethernet 00 that has a dual media port. Now, in my case, both copper and fiber are connected to Catalyst 1. They're not connected to the same port on Cat 1, so we should be able to observe the result of setting the media type. So now if I go to Cat 1 and if I do show CDP neighbors, I can see that R2 is connected to fast Ethernet 
0, 2. Let me go to R2 here and change the media type from RJ45 to SFP. What's going to happen here, and let's go back to Cat1, I can see that Fast Ethernet 0, 2 went down and Gigabit 0, 2 came up. Now, it's just pure coincidence that it is actually 0, 2 in both cases, but these are two completely different ports, as I explained earlier. So, if I do show CDP neighbor now, I can see that R2 is visible on Gigabit 0, 2 instead of Fast Ethernet 0, 2, where it was visible just before. Let's talk a bit about detecting error conditions on the switch. Switch has the capability to detect certain types of errors and automatically de de uh, disable the port on which these errors have been detected. This process is called the error disable process. It is turned on by default and it can detect a large number of error conditions. You can see which uh, conditions can be recovered, can be um, uh, protected using this uh, functionality using the error disable detect cause question mark command. Let me show you. So going to my terminal, I'm going to say show error disable detect here and I can see that my error disable functionality is enabled for large number of features. I can see, you see it enabled here for ARP inspection, the BPDU guard, the channel misconfiguration, that this refers to a uh, ether channel configuration. Uh, it can uh, detect uh, invalid uh, GBIX, it can detect the uh, problems with the inline power and so on and so on and so on. So this error disabled process is actually turned on by default. If a port detects, if a switch detects a problem on a port, it is going to shut this port down. Except it's not going to go into the admin shutdown mode. So if you do show interface, it's not going to show uh, down, down or administratively down, down. It is actually going to show down, down and then in parentheses, it's going to say error disabled. By default, the port will not automatically recover from this condition. Even if you unplug whatever was, un uh, whatever was plugged in on the other side and plug it back in, the port will not recover. The only way to recover from this condition is to manually shut down the port and then do the no shutdown. Sometimes this is desirable behavior and sometimes you actually want to have switch attempt to automatically recover from the error condition. And this can actually be uh, change. It can be changed on the switch using the error disable recovery cause command and here you can specify for which causes you want the switch to attempt to automatically recover from. You can specify either all or you can specify any of the causes that will uh, uh, cause the uh, switch to disable a port. Now, when error disable recovery is enabled, it is going to operate at a fixed interval. The default interval being 300 seconds. But you can change it to, uh, to any value between 30 to 86,400 seconds. The last thing that I want to talk about today is a very common error condition in the networks, which is called the duplex mismatch. This is the situation when one side of the connection is configured for full duplex and the other side is configured for half duplex. Now, this can have severe impact on the network performance. It, uh, it is going to get worse if you have large uh, uh, amounts of traffic going through your network and it can drop the transmission rates from 100 megabits per second down to about 10 megabits per second. And this is a situation that may be rather difficult to figure out for novice engineers. If you are using slightly older versions of the iOS, in some newer versions of the iOS, routers will tell you if they are noticing that you may have problems with uh, uh, duplex mismatch, but they're not necessarily going to tell you that. Also, CDP can be your friend in this situation because the CDP, when you have two switches connected, they're going to tell you that you may have a CDP 
uh, uh, that you have a duplex mismatch. But if you don't use uh, CDP or if you are using uh, say non Cisco devices or you are connecting a Cisco device to a, uh, to a, um, a PC, this situation may be a little bit tricky to discover. You actually have to use different methods to find out that you are dealing with the duplex mismatch. Your symptom number one in production network would be a severe degradation in the traffic. The next thing is you want to go ahead and take a look at the output of show interface command. Now, while I was doing this uh, module here, I actually had R1 and R2 send a large number of pings to each other. Now, R1 is connected to switch one and is connected to the port with a misconfigured, with a misconfigured duplex. So